Hello, I'm uh, Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape. I'm delighted to have a chance to have a conversation with Dr. Matt McCarthy of Weill Cornell faculty. He's just written a, a new book called Superbugs, and we're going to be going through that and getting to know Matt, and he's actually the author of three books, uh, so this is a, the culmination of a lot of writing. So Matt, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, so let me, I guess, first start is you been writing for a while and you're young. So how did you get started in this whole uh, career sideline? Yeah, you know, this is one of those things where I kind of fell into it. Uh, a lot of my friends happen to be writers. I was an undergraduate at Yale. And after college, my closest friends became a novelist, a screenwriter, and a writer for Sports Illustrated. <laughs> and I happened to be a baseball player and had some baseball stories to tell. And that led um, through a, a somewhat meandering process to my first book, which was about minor league baseball. And then after that uh, career or that chapter of my life ended, I went to medicine. And I wrote about my first year as a doctor. Uh, didn't go so well, <laughs> uh, the ups and downs of intern year. And then uh, most recently, I wanted to sort of broaden my, my writing experience and rather than doing a, another memoir, try to write about um, an issue that I was seeing every day in the hospital, which is the rise of these antibiotic resistant microbes. Right, so just so everybody knows uh, about your past uh, book accomplishments, the baseball book, Odd Man Out, uh, and you were on the baseball team at Yale, I guess, right? That's right, uh, and, 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 uh, it's, yeah. interesting to, it's interesting to see where teammates are going. One of my Yale baseball teammates is now the governor of Florida, Another one is the general manager of the Baltimore Orioles. Another one wow. got two, two uh, World Series rings with the Boston Red Sox. So it's kind of been fun to see uh, the trajectory of those college guys. Really? That's amazing. And then the second book uh, that you were talking about in terms of medical training was The Real Doctor Will See You Now. Um, so you, just to want to encapsulate that, that was about your, your, your training? Yeah, you know, I, I went to Harvard for medical school, and I, when I graduated, I was full of confidence and optimism, and then I became uh, an intern at New York Presbyterian Hospital up at Columbia on 168th Street, and during one of my first nights on call in the cardiac care unit, I misdiagnosed someone, and the person almost died because of an error that I had made, and all of the confidence and enthusiasm that I had evaporated in an instant. And so the book looks at how do you recover from that? You know, there was a lot of talk about how to prepare and cope for intern year, but that specific um, moment was something that I had never really encountered before. And I tried to recover from that in ways that um, I thought would be interesting to write about. I also became um, very close with a patient who was living in the hospital waiting for a heart transplant. And he, I would just see him every day riding on a stationary bike and I, in some ways, thought about his journey uh, as somewhat similar to mine in that we were both just showing up to the hospital every day, trying to make it through. Um, but of course, there are limitations to that comparison. But that, that first year was the formative time for me and one that I was uh, really excited to write about. Right. Well, now, uh, you then went on, I guess, to get uh, uh, infectious disease um, specialization. And um, that's what you do these days, I take it, right? That's right. So I do a mix of general medicine and my, my uh, clinical and research expertise is in fungal infections. And uh, the joke in my house is that my, my wife, who's a transplant nephrologist, likes to say, you know, of all the guys I could have met, how did I end up with the yeast <laughs> infection guy? <laughs> but that's really what uh, is, interests me. And it's taken on a, a really renewed uh, importance now that we have this multi-drug resistant yeast infection spreading around the globe, Candida auris. And so that's one of the areas that I focus on a lot. Well, that, that's a good transition to uh, superbugs. And I guess uh, just before that, just also to note that you have a really good sense of humor, which co uh, comes through in your, in your book and oh, uh, you. bugs, and I'm sure it does in the others as well. So that helps when you're transmitting a lot of information and telling stories is to have that, that side of humor. So you mentioned Canada Auris, but the other, uh, of course, major um, substrate in the book relates to uh, MRSA uh, and uh, other uh, multi-resistant uh, organisms. Um, maybe you could just kind of set the landscape as maybe first defining the term superbugs yeah. 
and then we can go from there. Yeah, I think that one of the, the, the definition is actually quite controversial. Uh, many people refer to it as simply drug resistant bacteria. Um, I take a somewhat broader view, um, which is to say that it also encompasses drug resistant fungi, parasites, protozoa, and some people would even say viruses. Uh, one of the controversial questions is, is influenza a superbug? And if you take that broader view, um, the scope of the problem is really uh, concerning. In fact, the World Health Organization just came out and said that by 2050, we could expect 10 million deaths worldwide every single year from superbugs uh, if we don't confront this problem. And so the idea that this was something that you know, doctors were talking about, researchers were thinking about, but the lay public, I don't think, appreciated the full scope of this issue is what really led me uh, to get into this. And I should say that after the book came out, I received an email from a professor uh, who said, you know, I don't like the term superbugs um, because uh, I, I prefer a term difficult to treat infections. Mm. And I said, well, I said, well, that's not really a great book title. Um, <laughs> but, but also, um, not all of them are difficult to treat. Um, I saw a patient two days ago who had a multi-drug resistant urinary tract infection but the infection was susceptible to an oral antibiotic and I treated the guy in the ER and sent him on his way. And so just sort of explaining what a superbug is turns out to be a rather complicated uh, endeavor. Yeah, yeah, no, well, you certainly uh, have come up with a good way to frame that. Now, um, the book gets into kind of two parts. One is you bring us back to the history of uh, antibiotics and you know the, how kind of where we got to the point we are today uh, and then you take us through this clinical trial that you uh, worked on, which had all sorts of uh, hills and valleys. And uh, maybe you could get us into that, that w what you got out of this, you know, this very complicated tri trial. This was with a drug from allergen. Uh, That's right. So, uh, well, could you tell us more about that. Yeah, the reason I took on this trial was that I discovered something rather surprising when I became a staff physician, which is that many of the newest antibiotics that are approved by the FDA aren't necessarily added to hospital formularies. If you walk into your local hospital, it probably isn't carrying the drugs that were approved last year or even the year before. The reason for that is that they are tremendously expensive. So um, an antibiotic typically costs about a billion dollars to develop and can take about 10 years of preclinical and clinical testing before it's approved. And so the companies charge a very, very high fee for these drugs to make back their investment. And I took on a trial with an antibiotic called Dalblevansin, which costs thousands of dollars for a single dose that our hospital had refused to carry. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I convinced the company to give me some of the drug for free and to run a trial and say, is there a way that we can use this drug in a way that benefits patients, benefits hospital, benefits the providers, um, and is also makes pharmacoeconomic sense. And so I thought that was a nice lens to look at the problem of superbugs and antibiotics uh, through this clinical trial where I was going up to patients and saying, I've got a new drug, would you like to try it? And they said, have you ever given it to anyone before? And I say, no. And they say, has anyone at this hospital ever given it to anyone before? And I'd say, no. And they say, well, why me? Right. And I thought that was a very powerful doctor-patient interaction that I, I wanted to explore in writing. Well, you certainly took us through that and all the different challenges that you confronted. Um, one of the things that was interesting is you worked uh, closely with your, your mentor. Uh, is it Tom Walsh, is it? Can you tell yes. us more about that relationship? Yeah, you know, when I was um, a resident, I interviewed for fellowship programs. And when I came to Weill Cornell, I met a guy named Tom Walsh who was moving his office from the NIH to Cornell. And we just bumped into each other in the hallway. And it was one of these moments where you just meet someone and you say, I'm going to work with that guy. Mm. Uh, and he and I have been sort of attached at the hip for the past 10 years. And he has a very unique uh, background in that he is trained in both adult medicine and pediatrics. He's trained in oncology and infectious diseases. He's also a world-class mycologist and can uh, has a photographic memory, it seems like. And so I went under his tutelage. And the reason that I chose to write about him is because I think mentorship is important. Uh, and it's something that to, needs to be talked about. But also because superbugs are so rare in some cases that there is no data to drive doctors in decision making. 
And what they have to do is make frantic phone calls to experts like Tom Walsh. And I don't think that people always appreciate that, that this, here was a man who was getting calls in the middle of the night from Berlin and from Sydney and all over the place saying, I've got a kid who has a multi-drug resistant uh, infection, what do we do? And it was this man making pharmacokinetic you know, calculations in his head and making life and death decisions about patients for whom he'd never met. And I, I thought that was something that needs to be talked about and, and also captures what's so exciting about infectious diseases. Right, no, it's really extraordinary. Now, along the way with this um, uh, antibiotic uh, testing, um, you, Dalba, that you uh, got into some uh, really interesting patient uh, encounters. Maybe you could pick a couple to tell us more about to give, it's really rich, so maybe you can. Yes, well, thank you. The, the first um, person who I ended up giving the drug to was a lawyer. And he was somebody who was very familiar with reading consent forms and with reading um, the nuances of um, a, a legal document that I was handing him to sign away. And what I thought was so interesting was that I handed him the, four, you know, I, I talked with him about uh, the risks and benefits of the trial and I handed him the long consent form and he put it down and he looked me in the eye and he said, I just have one question for you. Would you give this drug to your own mother? And it kind of caught me off guard, but that's such a great question for a clinical investigator who, you know, is bringing this new drug in. Uh, and, and I fumbled for a moment and, and I eventually I said, yes, I, I would. Um, and I thought that that captured something very special about the power of, of the physician in these clinical trials, but also the vulnerability of the patient. And I wanted to explore that. Uh, I also talk about some people who consent to the trial but I don't know if they're giving informed consent. And so I got really interested in the difference between consent and informed consent and how there are patients out there who may say yes to something because their doctor uh, is asking them and they feel like they may not get good medical care if they say no. And again, uh, that's a power dynamic that is, I think, unsettling to a lot of people. And it's one of the reasons that I included the historical background in the book to show how doctors were once allowed to police themselves and were allowed to draw up trials and conduct trials without any oversight and why that's such a fraught um, uh, endeavor and why that's such a dangerous thing and why we need things like an institutional review board to provide oversight. And then I also add how the IRB can be a needle in the side of a researcher like me. All right, all right. Um, another patient you'd like to, you, you, you get into several in the book. Uh, you might yep. have another. Uh, well, you know, one of them was a, a school teacher in Westchester and she had a MRSA infection on her, on, on her body. And all that she cared about was what would get her back in the classroom more quickly. And I thought that what was interesting there is that the unique uh, aspect of this antibiotic I was offering her was that you give one dose and it stays in your system for weeks, which allows you to go back to work more quickly. You don't have to stay hospitalized receiving an intravenous treatment. And it was one of these moments where she was, wasn't thinking about her skin or her fever or her infection. She was thinking about these students. And it almost you know, made me emotional, get choked up thinking about how the patients that I walk in to see every day have so much on their minds and how powerful um, that experience can be of, you know, you think about clinical research, it, it often is about Excel spreadsheets and consent forms and, you know, protocols. But in those unique moments where you're sitting at the bedside of somebody who's thinking about a classroom full of children, uh, it really turns into the whole experience into something unique. Right. Now, I hadn't heard of Dalba before. Um, and now where is this drug headed? Well, now that you've done yeah. that? Work. Well, this, this was the joy of, of doing research like this. So my hospital had never carried it and was never going to carry it. And then I pushed to do a trial that showed a, a statistically significant decrease in the length of stay. And it showed an imp improvement in the quality of care in a way that would actually save the hospital money. And so just recently, our hospital voted to approve it. And so now we're going to start using a drug that had never been used before. And one of the exciting parts is that the drug was approved for skin and soft tissue infections, but we're finding that it also has potential for use in bone and heart and bloodstream infections. Um, 
And so we're gonna start looking at how it may be used to treat other conditions. That's gonna be taking up quite a bit of my time moving forward. Right, and what would you say will be the indication, I mean, what, uh, for its use currently? Uh, I mean, when, when would you go to this drug? So we would not use it as the first line treatment for all patients. You know, if you develop a, a skin infection, you can often be treated with an oral antibiotic. And if that fails, many patients end up coming to the emergency room and get admitted for an intravenous treatment of vancomycin, and they end up staying hospitalized for several days. We're trying to prevent that. We're trying to capture the patients who fail an oral antibiotic and come to the ER looking for a second opinion or looking for help. And we can give them a dose of this drug and then get them back to normal life. And so that's really the, I think, the profound advantage of something like this. The tricky part when you start looking at it for more um, uh, deadly types of infection, like say a heart infection or a bloodstream infection, is that you don't necessarily want to discharge the patient quickly. You want to keep an eye on them. And so we're trying to design trials where we balance the fact that we can discharge patients more quickly with the need for observation. And that, as you can imagine, has a, a number of layers to it and some ethical components that we're wrestling with right now. Right. Uh, as I recall, vancomycin, which is used, of course, in MRSA, has a problem with uh, uh, C. difficile and pseudomembranous colitis, uh, which can be lethal. And um, as we've seen, microbiome fecal transplants as a, a therapy. What about uh, this drug? Well, vancomycin is what we often are using, but they, it has a lot of side effects, as you mentioned. Um, and beyond the ones you already mentioned, you know, it can cause renal impairment and red man syndrome. And, um, and there's also, we've been seeing that the staph aureus in the community is becoming increasingly resistant to vancomycin because it's prescribed so frequently. So we're trying to introduce a new drug um, that will capture some of those vancomycin intermediate susceptibility staph aureus and the vancomycin resistant staph aureus. Um, but this is something we have to use judiciously because we don't want to run with this new antibiotic and overuse it. So, right, yeah, right. you know, and, and that brings up a very challenging aspect of antibiotic development, which is that these companies spend a billion dollars to get a drug approved and then doctors don't want to use it. They want to use it as sparingly as possible. And that makes the market a very tricky thing for these companies. And I, I do want to get into that with you, which is the whole relationship with pharma. You know, they've largely abandoned developing antibiotics for some of the reasons you um, have touched on. And here you are, you know, you work uh, kind of against the grain, going paddling upstream to get this antibiotic to find some its utility. What, what, do you, what, what is your sense about um, biotech pharma, biopharma, and uh, antibiotic uh, development? Yeah, this is, I think, one of the most important issues in medicine that no one's really talking about, which is that for the past 75 years, we have relied on a partnership between the federal government, the NIH, and big pharma. So the NIH is very good at identifying talented scientists who can discover molecules, and then they partner with big pharma to bring that drug to market. And we have found that this partnership is dissolving, and that the antibiotics are not profitable, and big pharma is choosing to do other things with their time. And this is a big problem because just as superbugs are becoming more prominent and becoming more lethal, we're losing the partner who has helped us to make the treatments. So there are a number of proposals on the table to entice big pharma to come back to us and to make more antibiotics. Uh, these are called push and pull incentives. A push incentive is to go to a company We'll use Allergan, hypothetically, the company that makes uh, Dalbavancin. They also make Botox. They had $3 billion in sales last year. You could say to them, let's say hypothetically your corporate tax rate is 18%. We'll cut it to 15% if you promise to invest some of that excess profits into antibiotics. So this is called a push incentive. And then by contrast, there's a pull incentive, which is to say to a company, if you take the risk and develop a new antibiotic, and it gets approved, rather than giving you five to seven years of market exclusivity, we'll give you 25 years, which means that you can charge a higher price for a longer period of time and make back your, your investment. The problem with that is that it um, drives up the cost of healthcare and antibiotics are, are already really expensive. Um, but this is one of these issues that we're gonna be hearing more and more about, push and pull incentives. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's gonna become a political issue because we're seeing bipartisan legislation was just introduced 
something called the Disarm Act, where we're trying to get the government to step in. And in fact, in some parts of the world, uh, they're saying that we should nationalize the production of antibiotics. That's actually something that England has been talking about. And that we should look at antibiotics as a public good, like electricity or water. And that we should disentangle the whole thing from the profits and just say, let's pool our resources and make these things and share them. Right. Well, uh, there's a few th things that are related to that uh, I wanted to get into. One is you, you had a really great New York Times op-ed right around the time of the release of the book. It was about the fact that um, our hospitals are infested with superbugs. Um, not only are, what is it, 5% of healthcare workers are yeah. colonized with MRSA, but also they're everywhere. You, I think the, the picture was on the x-ray machines. And you yeah. want to comment about this kind of uh, colonization of medical facilities with bad bugs? Yeah, this is something that we're really wrestling with how to talk about superbugs in our environment. And this story became a really pressing issue when um, the New York Times put Candida Oris on the front page and they were talking about facilities um, in New York and in Chicago and some other states where they had this fungus. And the hospital PR departments kind of freaked out and they said, you know, we don't want you talking about this. And this was a challenge because uh, I'm an expert in this fungus and I was asked to speak about this quite a lot and they told me not to. And we're trying to figure out how and why we should discuss uh, superbugs. And so I wrote this op-ed saying, this story is not gonna go away. We can't just say no comment, uh, that we need to educate people. And there's a big push now for more transparency. The challenge with that is that there are people who will avoid medical care if they feel like their local facility is infested with superbugs and they're gonna catch something. Um, we don't want that. On the other hand, we don't want to scare people. And so we're trying to figure out, and I can tell you it's a work in progress right now, uh, how best to report what we're finding. And you know, I've treated patients with this Candida auris, and the part that got left out of the story um, that was reported on is that we cure them. This is not a death sentence. And in fact, we are likely at my hospital and other top-notch hospitals to see more of these superbugs uh, because we have the best diagnostic equipment, the best antibiotics, the experts who know how to treat them. And so it shouldn't be seen as a black mark against a facility um, if they have a lot of, of antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, within their walls. And so how do you convey that to the public is something that uh, we're working on, but I can say I wanted my book to be at least a first step in that direction. Right, no, oh, that's great. Um, another uh, related issue is climate change. And uh, th here we have a problem where um, we're, we're having some pretty drastic uh, effects uh, for healthcare. One of them is uh, indeed uh, worsening of infectious disease risk. Can you comment about that interaction? Absolutely. Um, the, you know, as the environment changes, it often leads to animals living in places that they used to not live. And they have all kinds of bacteria and viruses and parasites um, that can now come into contact with humans. And I used to study Ebola virus and Nipah virus, and I would go to these far-flung places um, where there was climate change happening and where there was deforestation, and it was causing a disruption in the ecosystem. And that was allowing this animal-to-human transfer of deadly pathogens. And we think that that's really where the next great pandemic is going to come from. It's that the coupling of um, a deforestation and climate change and some migration changes based on climate change are going to allow some pathogen to leap likely from a fruit bat or potentially a rat um, to a human and spread around the globe very quickly. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how uh, climate change will affect us. And in fact, the, the issue of drug resistant bacteria and microbes has been compared to climate change by some who say that it often gets kind of put out there as this thing that is um, something that others can, can deal with, but they, you yourself don't have any role in it. You know, if, a, if a, a manufacturing company is pumping out a lot of CO2, well, that's, that's something someone else is, is doing. But in fact, we all play a role in the rise of drug-resistant microbes, whether it's physicians who are inappropriately prescribing antibiotics, like myself, 
or if it's a patient who is prescribed five days of an antibiotic and they only take two days. Uh, that allows the, the bacteria to mutate and to evolve and to develop uh, all sorts of resistance mechanisms. So this is an issue that we all play a role in, and, and that's part of getting the word out. Yeah, I'm glad you've emphasized that. It doesn't get enough respect in uh, highlighting, and uh, it really needs it. And the other question I wanted to ask you about was um, we're seeing a revolution in sequencing pathogens. And just last week in the New England Journal, there was a report from UCSF and collaborators where brain infections were diagnosed um, uh, by sequencing metagenomics of cerebral spinal fluid. And of course, picking up things, it could be like tapeworm and all sorts of misdiagnoses. Some lives were saved, uh, limited number, but still uh, very impressive. And uh, the question is, are we gonna be moving to a time as you foresee, Matt, where we'll take a sample of body fluid, um, put it through metagenomics, um, making sure it's not a contaminant, but actually the, the causative uh, uh, um, pathogen, and also at the same time getting a readout on resistance, um, assuming we have enough informatics in the, in the bigger information resource to define that. Are we going to move to that point in, in the years ahead? Absolutely. Uh, this is what's so exciting for me. Uh, every week uh, on Thursday mornings, I go to the microbiology lab and I spend time with the team there to figure out how they're diagnosing infectious diseases. How are we detecting these things? And how are we ensuring that they're not contaminants? And what are we doing in terms of coupling that with identifying resistance genes? And what's so interesting to me is that we've seen this revolution in many aspects of how we detect um, drug-resistant microbes, whether it's the MALDI-TOF, which is using this, this laser, essentially, to identify drug-resistant bacteria, or whether it's gene sequencing for some of the viruses. But then for the area where I'm uh, most interest interested in, which is fungal infections, we're often diagnosing them the way we did 100 years ago. Uh, for mold infections, it's often me looking under a microscope and saying, what is the shape of this mold? And, and, and then comparing it to a textbook. And yeah. so in some ways, we're making these tremendous leaps and bounds with you know, metagenomic shotgun sequencing. And then in other areas, we're very seriously looking under a microscope and saying, I think this looks like mucorales, but it might also be aspergillus. Uh, let's take a look at the textbook that was written five years ago uh, and <laughs> compare it. And so there's, a, there's certainly a balance there. What, is Wild Cornell starting to do metagenomics in the cl for clinical uh, purposes? Well, so we do a lot of gene sequencing um, that is um, not reported out to the clinicians yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's stuff that we have for research purposes. But, you know, that's one of the big challenges we have is that we could report out all of the, the fungi that are in a patient's nostril. Um, but we don't want this to freak out the physicians. Uh, because most of that are those are commensal organisms or they're colonize, colonizers. And, and so it's interesting that, you know, I hit on the fact that it's a challenge for us to talk to the public about these uh, infectious diseases. It's also a challenge to talk to doctors. Um, a lot of them don't know what to do when they see this readout of 16 different viruses that are identified in a, a sample, and many of them may have no clinical relevance. Right, right. Well, there's a lot of I think potential uh, excitement and remedy for some of the issues that we're confronting today. And it's really noteworthy about how so much of what we do is archaic, uh, as you've pointed out. That was one of the great parts in the book about your grounding, historical grounding, you know, before getting into the where, where we headed in the future. So I want to congratulate you on Superbugs. Really <laughs> excellent you. book. And also for uh, being a, a really fine physician writer. We don't have enough of those. Uh, we welcome you to that uh, from writing from baseball to now writing about such an important issue. So Matt, great to have a chance uh, to be with you on this Medscape one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And thanks to everyone uh, in the Medscape audience for listening to our conversation, a really important topic. And we just need uh, more emphasis on developing antibiotics, on getting new ways to diagnose accurate quickly, dealing with resistance and preventing the resistance. So uh, Matt, thanks very much. Thank you. It's great to be here.